All right. Well, formally begin. I'm so glad all of you are here. Good evening. I hope you're all healthy and doing well in this crazy moment. Continued best wishes to all of you, to all of us. I'm Mike Wabacker, the Executive Director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Happy to welcome you all to Zoom tonight for the 15th annual presentation of the Henry Meggs Environmental Leadership Award. While I would normally be welcoming you to the Nature Center in our auditorium, I'm glad we have this virtual way to connect uh, and to gather to honor Jerome Shabazz and Sabira Mahmood, who I'll be introducing you to very shortly. If anyone is new to the Schuylkill Center, I hope some of you are, we're located up in Upper Roxborough. We've been connecting people to nature and the environment since 1965, pioneering in environmental education programs all those years. We present hundreds of programs to people of all ages who come to us from across the region. We operate the only wildlife rehabilitation clinic in Philadelphia, one of the few in the region, present an ambitious environmental art program in both our gallery and on our trails, and offer innumerable opportunities for you to volunteer with us. At least in a normal year, we would offer those opportunities for you. Uh, we also operate Nature Preschool, the state's first nature-based preschool. Because the students are outdoors all day, school has been in session since early September. Our preschool staff is unbelievably dedicated, and we appreciate them so much. So our school is still in session. Our trails are open dawn to dusk, so come for a walk. We're free, four miles of trails through forests, alongside ponds. Uh, so many studies show that walk in green spaces is really healing, it's good, it's calming, lowers your blood pressure. So in these crazy times, come for a walk. Our visitor center is open nine to five from Monday through Saturday, and our gift shop is full of green and sustainable products, perfect for the holidays. We're also a membership-based organization, so we welcome your membership as our members receive advance notice of our programs, discounts at our events, and discounts in our gift shop. You can easily join on our website. We'd also love to put you on our mailing list. You can sign up for that on our website as well. If anyone is new to Zoom, I hope you can find the features that you'll need for tonight. Look for two choices of uh, views on the top of your screen, top right corner of the screen. I wholeheartedly recommend speaker view as you will then see a larger image of the person talking. Gallery view will give you all of us, all these small tiles all lined up and the person talking is hard to find. So if you go to speaker view, click on that, um, that might be a, a, a better way to follow along with the program tonight. I also invite you to chat, to find the chat feature along the bottom of the screen, as we mentioned before. Later tonight, you'll be asking questions of our speakers via chat. So that button becomes important. Finally, please keep your microphone on mute so we can hear the speakers tonight. And I wanna thank you in advance for your attention to that. As we all know, as we, those of us who've been Zooming a lot, random odd noises come in through Zoom all the time. Um, thanks to Amanda Cohen, if you can pick her out from the group, our manager of public programs, who will be assisting me on Zoom tonight. Appreciate the help, Amanda, thank you. Thanks to all the members of the board of trustees who are here tonight. Our board is 20 wonderful volunteers who work very hard to make sure the center is moving forward. Christopher McGill is president of our board and just one of the many trustees participating tonight. So thank you, Christopher. Thank you to the rest of the board. The Henry Meggs Environmental Leadership Award is given annually to a visionary leader whose commanding presence and guidance towards our world's sustainable future reflects the spirit, integrity, and vision of one of our founders, Henry Meggs, the longest serving trustee in our history. He served on the board from our founding in 1965 through Unfortunately, his death in 20, 2005, 40 years later, a 40 year run on our board of trustees. To honor Henry's memory, we annually call on his son, Vinnie Meggs, a sculptor, and himself a former trustee and president at the Schuylkill Center to share a few thoughts about his father as we use this evening to keep Henry's memory alive. Vinnie, welcome. Thanks, Mike. And Vinnie, while you talk, I'm gonna share my screen and show some pictures of your dad while you talk. Uh, okay, it's probably a lot better than uh, I can make of myself <laughs> at the moment, but uh, I just wanna thank everyone uh, new to our event and uh, welcome all of you to our, uh, all of our many friends from the past also on this special night. Due to uh, COVID restrictions tonight is unique in the awards history. Our audience need not venture out into the wondrous forest preserve in remote Northwest Philadelphia to participate. And instead we can come together in this new way. As a brief review and an introduction to our new guests in particular about Henry Meggs and why the award is named for him, uh, 
Henry was one of the original founders of Schuylkill Center, and as the youngest and most passionate of the four founding family members, including his mother, his aunt, and his uncle, Henry was charged with closely administrating the actual institution as it got off the ground in 1965. He was 35 years old at the time and continued to monitor the Schuylkill Center until his death in 2005. Um, and that doesn't really even include all the planning and uh, family conversations that went on years before that. But this meant that all the board members and all the board presidents and the two executive directors who served during that 40 year period had to listen to Henry's opinions, which <laughs> considering Henry's otherwise reticent personality were frequent. Nature in every way inspired Henry. His greatest hope and pleasure was that others would be equally engaged, observant, and protective of their natural world. Henry was keenly aware that the expansion of populations across the globe would create an ever-increasing impacts upon the natural environment in numerous ways. At Schuylkill Center, he, with his family of founders, fostered a place of awareness and training and resource for learning about the problem. Over those 40 years, Schuylkill Center consistently sought Henry's guidance and found itself routinely asking when confronted with institutional challenges, what do you think, Henry? The board members would ask, and so would the directors. And among themselves, the board governance always found itself asking, what would Henry do? That was when my dad wasn't around. As Henry's son, I joined the board in 2006, and the board reminded me of their regard for Henry's advice in running such an unusual Philadelphia institution, suggesting that there should be some kind of honorarium in Henry's name because they held him in such high regard. I agreed. The concepts of an honorarium and a student award were born at that time, with the student part really becoming more active recently the governance could take time, as we all learn. Henry understood about taking time. He understood how key it is to involve youthful energy, guiding it towards responsible fulfillment. He knew from long experience that leadership could become supremely powerful if the nascent leader could be led out, which is the derivation of the word education. Henry knew that the quiet ones could have the potential to do the heavy lifting if they could properly find their way. The energies and purpose of this founder brought us at Schuylkill Center a long way by bestowing an award upon others, especially upon those with the courage and capacity to inspire, inspire the rest of us. The waypoints needed to steer our course through our most demanding environmental challenges might be just that much clearer. Even today, we may already be asking ourselves a question, what will our Meg's awardee say or do? We bestow tonight's honors with pleasure and admiration, and we look ever forward to our global environmental responsibilities as we remember one who came before to guide us gently over time. Thanks, Mike, and thank oh. you all. And Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Benny. Man. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yep. I always try not to be too wordy. I hope I <laughs> no, you're right. did, did it more or less okay. That was great. That was better than more or less okay. That, yes, thank you. Mike, Mike <laughs> loves pithy remarks about Henry, and I try, to, I try to keep him fresh. But it has been 15 years. Thank you, Benny. Thank you so much. And thank you for your commitment to the Schuylkill Center as well. It was so appreciated. Anyway. All right. Thank you, Benny. Uh, as Benny mentioned, the first Megs Award was given in 2006 when Dennis O'Brien, then president of PICO, was honored. In the years since, we have given the award to, to name only a few, uh, Governor Ed Brandel, our longtime friends John and Cindy Affleck, pioneering aquatic ecologist Tom Dolan, legendary botanist Ann, Ann Fowler Rose, environmental artist Stacey Levy, and last year, the mother daughter wildlife rehabilitators who founded the ARC in Bucks County. This year, we are thrilled to present the award to my longtime friend and colleague, Jerome Shabazz, a native Philadelphian 
After a successful career in stormwater management and wastewater treatment, Jerome recognized a huge void in the ability of Philadelphia children to understand their environment. Recognizing this need, he and his wife Gloria started a nonprofit organization in the late 90s dedicated to addressing the city's environment, which led to the formation of the Overbrook Environmental Education Center. Now in operation for about 20 years, Overbrook is an urban community-based center dedicated to environmental education programs, literacy, nutrition, and wellness for both Overbrook youth and their families. Most environmental education centers are founded on preserved natural areas. Instead, Jerome did something remarkable and frankly brilliant. He turned a contaminated post-industrial dumping site on Lancaster Avenue into a viable, healthy, sustainable space in the Overbrook Winfield neighborhood. Given its close proximity to Mars Park and Indian Creek, the center also provides a place where students can do hands-on activities in their backyard, like riparian studies and water quality sampling. While Overbrook's footprint is only two acres, it's a standard bearer of best practices in establishing green spaces. If you visit their site at 61st and Lancaster Avenue, you'll see green amenities like native plants, retention basins, and rain gardens. For this incredible work, for his work before that in protecting Philadelphia's water, the 15th annual Henry Meigs Environmental Leadership Award goes to Jerome Shabazz. I have the award, Jerome, to send you through the mail right here. You'll get this soon. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, wish I could pass it to you virtually. <laughs> um, and your name will appear uh, engraved on a perpetual plaque that hangs uh, in the Schuylkill Center. Finally, Jerome, you are featured on the front cover uh, of our newsletter, The Quill, uh, wow. the winter edition, which is going out. It's at the printer right now. So going out to all of our members and supporters. So Jerome, welcome. Congratulations. And thank you so much for your years of hard work. Mike. Thank, thank you very much. I, I wish we could travel together all the time and you can do introductions, but I, I really appreciate that. Uh, so I want to thank you, your entire team at the School Kills Center, uh, your board president, Christopher McGill, your board of trustees, Benny Meigs, uh, as well as the Meigs family for this, this wonderful award. Um, also, I want to congratulate Sabrina uh, McMood for her award today, too. You know, I, I'm very pleased to, to be now in the ranks of, of past awardees such as uh, Mike DeBardinas and Carol Williams Green, uh, Joe Minot, and, and, and former mayor and governor in Dell. Um, but although I'm the founder and director of Jazz Tech and the Overbrook Center, this award is, is actually a testament of the hard work of many others uh, who are part of our team. First and foremost, I need to acknowledge my, my wonderful wife, Gloria Shabazz, who was at the very beginning with all of this. So we want to congratulate her. And um, on, our, on our board, our board members, uh, I believe our president, Roosevelt Sanders, is, is also online, Carol Singleton and, and Joel Clymer. Um, but uh, I want to give a, a little shout out to our team because this is, is what's important to us that we all work together and that we build a, a, an organization that's, that's constantly working towards our environmental ends. Uh, so I wanna mention Marvin Kincaid Jr., Alice Wright, uh, Marvin III, uh, Jennifer Rollins, Jimmy Leggins, John uh, Charlton, Adib Shabazz, uh, Naomi Nayanango, uh, Jermaine Edwards, and Amatula Brown, all of these are folks who are part of our team. So we want to thank you for your hard work and your dedication. And I share this award with you. So as Mike mentioned in his introduction, um, the Overbrook Center over the past two decades has exceeded all of our expectations. However, in the early years, we were merely focused on improving environmental literacy for our students, emphasizing the importance of healthy air quality, water, soil, and food with students at the Overbrook High School in West Philadelphia. But what we quickly realized was that there was a disconnect for our students between what they were learning and what they were experiencing. Many of our young folks did not enjoy a healthy relationship with the built and natural environments around them, with blight, poorly funded parks, broken window syndrome, excessive trash, and let's not forget the trash. Oh, the trash was a big deal for our kids. And I can recall, as if it was yesterday, one of our high school students from Overbrook asking, Mr. Shabazz, 
if the environment is so important, why is there so much trash everywhere in our neighborhoods? And that student's question sort of haunted me because it made me put in motion a set of questions that I think actually created the path to where we are today. Her questions in turn required me to ask a few questions of my own. How do we as an organization help our young people reconcile the differences between the environmental conditions that they see and experience every day versus what we're teaching in class, what the environment could or should be? So now that we are dealing with these questions, uh, we have to modify our approach. And we can also say that not only is that an issue for students, but we also realize that that's an issue for some of our disadvantaged folks in the city as well. So we had to ask ourselves, you know, what do we do to re reconcile how our community looks from the perspective of the student? How do we build trust in our process? How do we measure our progress? And how can we make our successes a new normal? But not only the student, but for the entire Overbrook community. Our answers became very clear to us that we had to be the example that we sought from these students. We had to build a neighborhood-based institution that demonstrated a history of correcting, resolving, and preventing environmental burdens from disproportionately impacting those most vulnerable against protecting themselves from it. We did not want these environmental impacts to identify and target people just because of where they lived or the zip codes that they lived in. We needed to create a new kind of social architecture that enabled all of our citizens, all of our students, all of our constituents, even the non-technical folks, to better understand the impacts of the environment on their health, quality of life, and the way they lived. The intersectional aspects of health, environment, and community was very important to us. And we still preserve that as a guiding principle in how we do our work. This approach we now call our social architecture for resilient and sustainable communities. This is an architecture that makes room for all of our citizens, irrespective of their zip codes. An architecture that it, that's inclusive, equitable, and just builds trust for the future, not only in their communities, but in their lives. So I could probably go on about this work around social architecture, but I'll talk more about that as we approach our, our discussion panel. But thank you again uh, for this wonderful award, the 2020 uh, Henry Meggs Award, and I look forward to the opportunity to have further discussions later on this evening. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you, Jerome. Thank you for those comments. And yes, we're gonna come back to this in just a few minutes um, and inviting our speaker, uh, our panel of speakers to talk with you. But first we'd like to give the Youth Leadership Award. And for this, I'd like to call on Aaliyah Green-Ross, our Director of Education, to present the award. Aaliyah. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everybody. And I am really pleased uh, this evening to introduce Sabira Mahmood as our recipient of the Henry Mig Youth Environmental Leadership Award. At only 17 years old, Sabira has demonstrated tremendous leadership abilities, as well as a deep commitment to environmental justice and particularly to climate justice. As a high school sophomore, Sabira helped organize Philly's youth climate strike in 2019 coinciding with hundreds of similar strikes around the world and the largest environmental protest in history. While visiting family in Bangladesh, she witnessed the trauma that communities experienced from large scale flooding due to climate change. It inspired her to take action here at home, founding Youth Climate Action Team Philly, becoming the executive director of the Pennsylvania chapter of Youth Climate Strike, and also organizing nationally with US Youth Climate Strike. She successfully used social media to connect with and to motivate her peers on behalf of the environment and their futures. As a daughter of immigrants, a woman of color, and a Muslim, Sabira knows firsthand the intersectionality of climate justice with other forms of social justice. Her leadership, her insight, and her dedication are precisely what our city is going to need to mitigate the impacts of climate change, both in our environment and in our communities. I can't wait to see what the future holds for this inspiring young leader. Sabira will soon 
receive the statuette that Mike is holding right now in the mail. Her name will be placed on a plaque in the Schuylkill Center that holds the name of MIGS awardees. And we're thrilled to send her a scholarship gift of $1,000 that she can use for the college of her choice. Please join me in congratulating the recipient of the 2020 Henry Miggs Youth Environmental Leadership Award, Sabira Mahmood. Thank you so much. Angela Davis once said, I think the importance of doing activist work is precisely because it allows you to give back and to consider yourself not as a single individual who, has may, who may have achieved whatever, but to be part of an ongoing historical movement. Her words represent what I represent today by accepting this award, not only for my individual achievements on being a resilient member of this movement, but contributing to a greater fight in our city and in our world. It wasn't easy to begin organizing a mass movement at the age of 16, and a year later, it still isn't easy as one of the few women of color taking up space in a predominantly white movement. This award symbolizes not just the work I myself put into our fight for climate justice, but, to all, but also to magnify that we as a movement are prioritizing the work and the message of those who are continuously silenced. However, I'm not here today because of my own efforts, but because of my supportive family who has, who has forced me not only to prioritize my own well-being, but the well-being of the world, and also to focus on my own health after long days of organizing. My friends who uplift my, my spirits and allow me to take breaks and, the, and to the elders and the community members who have spent hours advising me and supporting me through action planning. This award may be awarded to me tonight but it signifies a greater meaning in the future of our movement and to, the support, and to the support that the community has in uplifting our demands for a cleaner and greater world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sabira, really appreciated it. Thank you, Aliyah, for the remarks introducing her. Um, and uh, for everybody, Sabira actually gave a presentation to our staff. We have a lunch and learn once a month and Sabira was our speaker at lunch and learn. So it was just wonderful. Uh, Sabira, I feel so much better uh, as one, <laughs> as a climate activist <laughs> from 40 years ago, <laughs> knowing that our future is in the hands of people like you. So I really appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Um, and Jerome, before I appreciate, before I introduce the panel, we begin our conversation. I thought, I wonder if you would have some words that you would offer to Sabira as well. Uh, all I can say is, is, is the Sabira doesn't need me getting in her way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that at some point we all have to know when to step aside and when to let folks go ahead. And, and, and you, have the, the for, you have the foresight and the vision to, to do exactly what needs to be done. So we congratulate you. Um, may God continue to bless you and your family for all of your hard work. Thank you, Trump. Again, Sabira, thank you so much from all of us. Appreciate it. Okay, Jerome, we're going to bring our panelists into the conversation. Um, this is your dream team that we assembled to have a conversation with you tonight. Let's first bring in Radhika Baskar, who's an assistant professor in engineering at Thomas Jefferson University's School of Design and Engineering. Her focus area in teaching is on sustainable, sustainability and systems thinking. And her research interests include environmental engineering based solutions to sustainability challenges that disproportionately impact low income minority and immigrant communities. Radhika, welcome. Glad you're with us. Thank you. And I just want to say congratulations, Jerome, and congratulations, Sabira. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Salim Chapman is Deputy Director in the city's Office of Sustainability and serves as Philadelphia's first Chief Resilience Officer. In this role, he oversees the creation and implementation of climate preparedness and resilience strategies. Before joining the city of Philadelphia, Salim amassed an array of experiences in the sustainability field, including urban policy analysis, environmental justice, and sustainable economic development. Welcome, Salim. Thanks, Mike. And, and I'll just echo Ridiculous comments in terms of congratulations to Jerome and, and Sabira. Thank you. So glad you're here with us. Thank you. And Tavis Dockwiller is the founder, principal, and guiding influence of Viridian Landscape Studio, a design firm that has worked on several Schuylkill Center projects, including our gateway on the Schuylkill River Trail, which I hope you all have seen. 
a natural storyteller and gifted communicator, Tavis builds consensus among diverse stakeholders and counsels clients on balancing long-term ecological resilience with memorable placemaking. Her work and ideas on the healing power of landscapes have helped reshape cities, transform college campuses, and improve lives for communities all over the country. Good evening, Tavis. Hi, good evening, Mike. Congratulations, Jerome and Sabira. You give me um, great, great confidence and, and hope for the future. So Jerome, I wanna, I wanna start with and focus and then bring everybody else around this conversation about um, the architecture for resilience, uh, I'll explain, resil social architecture for resilient and sustainable communities. There we go. Mm -hmm. And you also say there are pillars to this architecture. There are five pillars, right? Yeah. Which are? So um, it's inclusion, it's sustainability, it's justice, respect, and prosperity. So these are the pillars of the social architecture. Yeah, so what it is is a, um, it's the interpretive layer of, of activities relative to making sure that there is space for human involvement with environmental issues. Got it. Radhika, you're a systems thinker and an engineer. When you hear um, Jerome talk about a social architecture with these pillars, what, what goes through your mind? What, what's, what systems do you see in play here? I think that's a really important question because what Jerome is describing is really inspirational in trying to kind of redesign a system, really. Like he's trying to like link things that have not been intentionally and deliberately linked. So that's really exciting to see. Um, in a lot of the work I've done, we have talked about the need to recognize, we call it a socio-ecological system. So the need to recognize that our well-being is linked, so intrinsically linked to the well-being of our environment and vice versa. We impact it and we're influenced by it. So um, I, I'm really inspired and intrigued by the sort of pillars that he is describing. Mm -hmm. And Tavis, your systems thinker too, though your systems are different. You're thinking about sort of landscapes as systems. So when you hear about this kind of social architecture, how do you fit landscape? What's the overlay for you? Well, I. Really, we, I, our tagline is right. We make um, hilly ecological systems while making beautiful places for people. And it, it is really only through the intersection with people and listening to what they want and need that we can give them the places that fill their souls and are, are healing and can become um, the ecological systems that, that, that uh, bind, us, bind us together and keep life going. So it's all about the people, even though I love the nature. Yeah. And as context, your firm has done a lot of work with the Overbrook Center, correct? That's true. Yep. So you've done work on like stormwater. What, 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 what kinds of things have you been doing? Well, I always joke about this, you know, back in 1850, when Jerome and I met, and there's someone else out in the audience, Todd Woodward, who we all mm -hmm. came together because Jerome um, brought a project to, to the um, Community Design Collaborative, and he had this dream for this environmental center. And so we started to, uh, to work with him to help him uh, make these ideas he had for creating a great place into the physicality of place. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Salim, um, so Jerome was talking about resilience, perhaps in a slightly wider way than I think you're focusing on resilience. So you're talking about climate resilience. Um, I don't want to come back to that notion in a second, but when Jerome talks about uh, resilient communities, what goes through your mind? Yeah, well, well it's, it's really all related. Um, for us, because the, the idea is, you know, communities that are confronting um, environmental injustice and environmental oppression are often our most resilient, right? Like those are the places that we need to go through to take the lessons uh, that we're ultimately going to carry forward to, to confront the crisis that awaits us. And so I think the work that we need to be doing now is ensuring that we have the structures in place that we can distill that knowledge and, and obtain those insights. Uh, to really inform the work that we're doing. So it's, it's right on par with where um, I hope that the city wants to be. So when I introduced you, I said you were Philadelphia's first chief resilience officer. So it might be news to some of our listeners tonight that there is such a, a person with the city. So explain that role with the city. 
And, th and this is happening in cities across the country now, by the way. Yeah, so it is, it is um, well, in terms of how Philadelphia came about it, when Mayor Kinney was re-inaugurated in January, he made two things central to uh, the second term of, of his administration. Um, the first was uh, racial equity, and, and there was some um, revision into the city's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to advance that work. And then the second was uh, preparing for the impacts of climate change, which also called for the higher of a chief resilience officer to try to coordinate those efforts across all levels of government. Um, and the idea of a chief resilience officer was really furthered by a movement by the Rockefeller Foundation that started in 2014 and just recently ended. And the idea was to have 100 resilient cities um, across the world. And, and really the position of a chief resilience officer was, was deemed uh, as the necessary role to carry that work forward. And so Philadelphia is a unique company, not only just within the United States, uh, but in the world, because there are very few of these positions where we're maybe in like 101, 105 uh, territory in terms of chief resilience officers around the world. That's great. We should invite you back for an, another conversation about this in more detail. I'd love to hear more about this. So Jerome, back to you. So you've heard each of the speakers talk about uh, a little bit about your rea their reactions to the social architecture. So kick us off a level. How do we keep or maybe drill down a little deeper into this. What are, what are some examples of how this might play out, especially like what are some of the projects that Overbrook may have done that sort of help us understand this concept better? So, so over the first, I would say 10 years of our organization, we were strictly looking at uh, restoring and reestablishing a healthy environmental space in an urban environment. So we wanted to identify what kind of strategies that we can initiate around protect, preserving and protecting clean water, clean air, clean soil, uh, healthy food. But very quickly, we began to realize that there was a disconnect, a disconnect between the environment and the people that it impacted, the, the health of the community. So what started to happen for us, we began to deliberately and very intentionally look at the impacts of the environment on human health. So when we started looking at issues uh, that were health disparities in our communities, such as, as asthma, we, we had to start making the connection between interior and exterior air quality. When we start looking at the climate changes where we have severe weather and extreme heat, how does heat related illnesses impact a person's health? How does, um, water and, and, and the poor quality of water impact human existence. And I think what began to happen for us is we started to, to excite the communities who typically didn't have it, environmental issues as a priority because we connected it with their human health. So I think the architecture, what it does, it allows you to create this sort of intersectional or systems approach to how environment, how health, and how community is all interrelated. Mm. Okay. Uh, by the way, some people have discovered this, they can use the chat. So those of you who are chatting, it's great. If you want to ask questions or draw in the panelists, put your comments in, uh, in chat. Um, Jerome Kimberly and her colleagues at Philadelphia Orchard Project, congratulate you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and they're, they're great partners. Um, so thank you, Kim, and uh, and 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 all of the all of the folks at the, at Pop. We, we love you guys. <laughs> um, one of the comments is, "It sounds like we're talking about the One Health concept." Anybody heard about One Health? I think it's actually a project that's launched by veterinarians. It might be. Hmm. So the health of the whole planet is all connected. Um, so uh, put more in chat if you want to say more about that. Um, Radhika Tavis, Salim, anybody want to comment on anything at this, what, what Jerome just was offering? Well, Jerome, I was actually just still kind of mulling and thinking about the work that people like Savira and Greta and sort of this younger movement is doing to sort of re-energize and bring a lot of important attention because it is their future. It is going to be impacting them more than any of us. Um, do you see a lot of similarity in the type of social architecture you're talking about and the work they're doing? Do you think they're embedded in that framework? 
Yeah, I, I think what's happening is that we're starting to see a, a cultural shift. And a, a great deal of what's embodied in our cultural shift is people who are non-traditional to this work getting the permission to participate in the work. And part of that permission and that validation is situations that we have here tonight. We're, we're, we're cheering Sabira on. We're telling her you have all the right, all the permission, all of the legitimacy to participate in this work. But most importantly, and this is a very important factor, you are never too young to take yourself seriously. Never too young to take yourself seriously. And as a result, others will take you seriously too. So there's no situation now where younger folks are, are thinking, well, I have to wait before I can get in. I have to wait before I get started. They know that they can get started right now. That's an example that we're seeing. In well, and, uh, Jerome, I think that, that you really have done that with, with Overbrook. You have given young people an access way. And you know we've done work for many, many years with all sorts of environmental centers and nature centers. And, and one of the things we've talked about a long time is how can we take the work that is done with children and make it part of the science it's real work. When they do a water quality study, that's real work. And I think you have really connected that to the neighborhood in such a, an important way. So people, people see uh, the problems with lead, people see the problems with water, and their research is, is real. And it's, it's part of revealing the story and changing the outcome. It's huge. Yeah. Now, the beauty of us being around for, for two decades is that we've had students who started out um, participating in our brownsfields cleanups, participating in our repurposing of our site, who are now students in college. I remember a student recently, uh, about six months ago, was sitting for a dissertation for his PhD, and, and we were both on the phone crying because I'm like, I remember you when you were younger, but this, this guy was saying that my 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 defended thesis was on the work that we were doing out in Overbrook. And we have, at this point, about 12,000 students who've come through the center with very similar kind of results. But there's a real example of the legitimacy of their work that's still ongoing. They remember when we were doing the cleanup studies. They remember when we were doing the phase one and phase two environmental studies. They remember being introduced to DEP and EPA officials and talking about what needed to happen and it was beautiful, and I wanted to really give another shout out to Community Design Collaborative. When you guys were involved, and especially Todd, our good friend Todd, when we had this program, Architects in Education, it enabled us to embed architects into the classrooms of the students and get conceptual concepts around what the site could look like. They were involved in informing what we were doing in our next steps. So it's a beautiful cycle when we can make room for that type of participation. By the way, we have congratulations to you from London. So <laughs> we, are, we are international. That is the beauty <laughs> of Zoom. <laughs> so congratulations to Sabira and Mr. Shabazz. So thank yes. you. Um, Jerome, you've been doing this work long enough that have you had a sense that um, some of the kids who came to you 20 years ago found that through you, they had both a model and permission to do this kind of work? I can do science. I can be a scientist. I can be an engineer. I can do this kind of work. Absolutely. I, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, I just see uh, so Tina Rosen, professor at Temple. She's, uh, she's online. Hi, Tina. And Tina, some of Tina's students who we taught through lectures and presentations and through works are now working for the Overbrook Center. So you can't get any, any better than that, where students are impressed by the work, have a chance to engage in the work, and then become uh, in, in a position where they can make the work part of their, their, their um, profession. That's great. Mm -hmm. Sabira, you have my permission to unmute um, yourself at any point and jump in if you want to say anything because we've been talking about you a little bit. But um, I know I've been startled at the number of kids worldwide who've jumped into this cause with unbelievable passion. It's been both breathtaking. And for me, you know, for me, I, I will confess, there's a level of disappointment for me in that my generation didn't take care of this to the extent that they now have to. I kind of like, I feel like I dropped the ball. 
Um, I, I personally feel this way a lot that I dropped the ball. I didn't mean to give this to my kids. I was supposed to have taken care of this, but anyway, so there was a guilt level with me. <laughs> um, well, but it, you know, I think it's a continuum, Mike, and I think yeah. that that's that's what we're seeing, right? You know, there's always an ebb and a flow, and um, sometimes things get really awful before we can really break a system and start to change it in substantive ways. I'm not suggesting that I like that ebb and flow, but yeah. I am saying that you know we've cracked a bunch of things wide open in a way that I think we can uh, address things differently now. And I was going to chime in, and oh. Mike, sometimes the guilt is a, is a healthy motivator. I think so, yeah. Sabir, you know, go in ahead. Every, in every lifetime, we live multiple lives. So we <laughs> do the next. I wanted to quickly just turn in and, like, kind of just add, like, another, I guess, perspective into, like, um, I guess the reason young people are more, I guess, joining this movement currently is because we find um, – but I feel like the environmental movement has shifted from where it was, I guess, like, uh, like three decades ago, de decades ago, or even like, you know, last year, where our generation is kind of like seeing a more intersectional approach where it's not like, it's not just our parks, it's not just our earth, but it's also kind of like, it goes into like, so much more about like how um, the climate relates into so many other issues of injustice, like racial injustice and like economic inequities and so much more that our generation now sees it as like the biggest issue because it's not just the fact like we're going to lose our earth but like our communities are currently being most affected like even right now are just losing their homes and there's so much that is it's not just an impending doom it's already here if that makes sense no it makes so sense so our generation kind of has a more like we're centering the voices that are currently being affected and that have been affected in the past which like even can be like known by my story about like how Due to my connection with my um, with my parents, my parents' country um, of birth, Bangladesh, like I'm able to see that perspective of like this this um, this crisis is already here. It's not something that's like futuristic. It's not like an apocalypse. It's already here. It's already affecting people that we can't see. Or for like my friends who live um, near the refinery and you know Philly Thrive members, like they, you know they're a group that like if you look a few years ago they wouldn't have been listened to because when we thought about environmental causes we thought about like you know like single actions and like you know recycling like that was the problem but now like we're looking at it at a more like i guess like the real picture so i think that's the reason like our generation is you know a little more i guess not pumped but like um we're more like engaged and more willing to mobilize because we see it as a more like it's going to affect us in so many ways. It's going to affect every single part of our lives. And now we're just, we want to fight for a better world. Not just in terms of like, you know, you know, reusable and sustainable like home supplies, but like just a better world. That's great, thank you. Panelists, anybody wanna comment on, on this? Wanna jump in? Sure, I, I can I can jump in. Um, I, I think Sabir is com completely right. And, you know, the way in which we think about uh, climate change um, from, from my office is it's a multiplier of existing threats, right? So all these things that we've historically faced in this country are only more amplified by the experiences that we're going to get from, from climate change. And so, you know, for me, what, I, what I've always communicated recently is that if you look at the last year, even look at the last six months in this city, you see the essential essence of climate change, right? So we had uh, COVID, then we had um, the, the, the social uh, protests in response to anti-Black racism in June. Then we had the third hottest July on record. Then we had a tropical storm, which had complete, complete devastation in Eastwick. Then we had uh, the civic unrest in response to um, Walter Wallace Jr., all these factors complicating, overlapping, compounding, that is in essence climate change, right? And so when we think about these things, it isn't necessarily just confined to ideas of, you know, climatic trends, but it's really thinking about how do we respond to oncoming disruption and disruptions that's coming at a more increasing pace and cadence. And so 
we have to think beyond the bounds of what we've traditionally thought in response to these crises. And, and so that was sort of the idea behind um, defining a definition around resilience in the city because it's not only just about guarding against those acute disruptions to the system, but also sort of the everyday daily stressors that make people more vulnerable. So you're thinking about housing, economic inequality, environmental justice issues. And that's why environmental justice and environmental justice policy sits at the heart of the city's climate response, but because we can't make communities more resilient unless we deal with historical uh, trauma. Well, and I, I, I want to comment on that if, if I can. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think we, we really battle against is this idea of, you know, what is the right landscape? I mean, we got sold after the Second World War the idea that, you know, a Levitt town was going to be the right landscape. And it meant that, you know, everybody was going to have this particular kind of house and then they were going to have a, you know, a green lawn and they were going to have these perfect trees. And, and I've found in my work that that's a conversation I have to have with everybody across the board that is that really the healing landscape? Is that really what gives us clean water and clean air? And I think... And is it sustainable? And is it sustainable, right? And, you know, we sit at a point when we're finally recognizing the, um, the social justice aspect of this. And I ask that question, if we want to rethink our cities, what is the right way for them to be? And I'm not suggesting right. there is a perfect right way. I'm just suggesting that we have not been doing this properly and we have to have a much more integrated approach to our neighborhoods and our landscapes. Um, I just offer as a bridge to Jerome that um, Thoreau famously wrote in wildness is the preservation of the world and you know so many people wear that on t-shirts and have posters of that uh, up on their walls but the corollary to that that we forget that if we want to have wildness we have to have cities because the suburban landscape that sprawls out across wild areas makes wildness disappear. So what we need are livable cities so that we can have biologically diverse forests around those cities. The, the two are needed co-equally. So Jerome, we need sustainable cities for us to have any, any kind of nature. Yeah, right, right now 60, 60 to 70 percent of all citizens in the United States lives in urban settings. Right. And, and what, what, we're, what we're talking about is not necessarily just the, the physical design and an interpolated relationship with the built and natural environment, but we're talking about how to bring everyone along with this in that elevated process. Right. You know, we, we cannot get away from the fact that 24 to 27% of all Philadelphians live in poverty. We're talking about people who are now creating priorities that may not be on the same spectrum of the conversations we're having today, but we still have to take that in consideration when we're having our conversations. If people are spending an adverse amount, the people who can afford it the least, spending an adverse amount of their resources on public health issues that are derived from environmental conditions, right. that's where we need to be able to create a structure to help to remediate them. We know that our poor, our disadvantaged, our most vulnerable, and our black and brown communities are most adversely affected by inappropriate design, inappropriate substructure and inappropriate uh, uh, creation around relationship to the, to the natural environments and their communities. I mean, we've been dealing with issues such as, as the domestic toxins that are, are in these older poor neighborhoods where people can't afford to do work on, on soil, where they're not able to do work on, on, on buildings and infrastructure. Uh, one issue that we've been working on quite a bit was the issues of lead. Right. And uh, uh, one of our, I noticed that Joanne Don was on, she was very helpful in helping us with the water department's uh, messaging around lead. You know, after, at the Flint, Michigan, everybody was wondering whether or not Flint could happen in Philadelphia. So city, the city was wise to get ahead of the issue and to let people know that you were more likely to get exposed to lead through contaminated soil and through paint chips in your home than you were the water but we had to have that broader conversation. Mm -hmm. and what was interesting when we were structuring that kind of conversation with the public 
was how do we make that a priority so that people were interested in, in the discussion? And we really didn't start to get leverage again until we were able to, to connect the probability of children getting poisoned and started showing data around elevated blood lead levels in children throughout the city that we were able to get the attention of people deciding, hey, maybe is, is this happening in my community? Is this happening in my home? And what can I do about it? So we have a strategy now at Overbrook. We answer three questions whenever we do community engagement. One is how well did we describe the conditions of the environmental problem? Two, have we described the conditions well enough to make it a priority for people who have other compelling issues in their lives? Mm. And then three, what can they do about it so that they can be an active participant in the wellness of their community and family? Well, and Jerome, I think you do, you do something with this that's really, really important. Uh, and, I, and I forget which pamphlets you were doing, but you had been asking you know, questions of the community and trying to give them information. And you told me a story of it wasn't flying. No one was getting it. So you went back to the community to people, you know, who were trusted. And you said, you know, what's wrong with these? People aren't hearing this message and they're unable to uh, change the circumstance to galvanize for action. And you, you listened and got the words from the community, how they wanted to, what, what they could hear, how they wanted to be spoken to. Um, it was really about getting the correct conversation going so the issues could be talked about and the challenges could be met. It's amazing. Yeah, and, and when, you, when you mentioned that point, uh, Tava, you remind me of, of why the social architecture is so important because the inclusion is important, the engaging of, of the community is important, the ability to have reflective listening and feedback to the constituents that you're dealing with about their own concerns and making sure you're getting it right. And most importantly, seek to, to understand more than you seek to be understood. Hmm. It has to be a, a collaborative experience. Radhika, what's been going through your mind as you've been listening to the conversation? Well, I was going to say one thing I wanted to highlight that I think, Jerome, you and the Overwork Center do very well, which was not something I thought about in my formal <laughs> Like when we, when you learn about environmental problems, when you learn about environmental engineering and how to solve it, is really to be deliberate about thinking about the workforce component. And I think one of the things you do, which is really nice, is, and I think this is what is another way to galvanize young people, is to say there's opportunity here to build the skills, to build the certificates, to give them the pathways, so that it's not just about solving the environmental problem, but it's about creating you know, job and work opportunities too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one of the first uh, opportunities that we really started to build on was engaging with the career technical education divisions of the Philadelphia School District. And it was amazing because they had alternate schedules, they had more flexibility, but within their mandate, they had to have these sort of demonstrative uh, skill sets and those demonstrative skill sets have to be tied to real world experiences. And so we were very pleased in numerous projects of ours. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we were attempting to build the first greenhouse at our site, it was an amazing experience because at the time there was no zoning codes, there were no mandates on how it can be done. And so when we went to license and inspection to get approval to build our greenhouse high tunnel, um, they basically told us to go away. <laughs> and so we thought that the guy was, was joking, but he said, no, I'm too close to retirement. Please leave. I don't need this burden. So you're a square peg in his round hole, I guess, huh? Well, but what, what ultimately <laughs> happened was we, we ended up encouraging the, it was, it was beautiful timing. Sometimes the challenges are, are meant to, to encourage you to work harder. It was a beautiful timing because the city was at the time considering new zoning ordinances. And so now you have a zoning ordinance that takes into consideration high tunnels and greenhouses and a, a setback. So we were the first uh, official uh, organization that ever had a licensed greenhouse in city, city, the city of Philadelphia's history. Here's, here's what's exciting about that. Um, 
when we went back to find out exactly what the issue was, why, why was this so difficult to build a greenhouse in a, in a city that's, that, in a neighborhood that's a food desert? Right. It turned out that um, there were some problems with, with engineering where if it wasn't secured properly, we wanted to elevate it, it could blow off into a neighbor's backyard and nobody wanted that to happen. But we called on our friend, uh, our, our Todd Woodward at, at uh, S&P Architects. He said, you're gonna have to have an architect design this. You're gonna have to have a structural engineer lay this out. And Todd was like, at this time, he was, he was really trying to figure out how we could do it the most efficient way because we never had enough money for him. And so we, we, we went to Overbrook High School's Career Technical Education Architectural Division, had the students do the preliminary layout Ty did the revisions to it, reduced the cost of that kind of installation in half, and we had the first group of high school students in the city's history that ever had plans that were submitted to l and I. So that's great. Students the opportunity to, to see their work, see their value, see their contribution realized uh, is, 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 is invaluable. And that's the main reason why we think of uh, performative activities and project-based learning as, as one of the essential methodologies for, for, for advancing this movement. That's great. So, Celine, people often say that they're, uh, you know, you can't fight City Hall. Uh, City Hall becomes a metaphor for um, trying to get good stuff done, but you're sort of stuck not being able to do it. Celine, you're suddenly in City Hall. I'm curious what that's like for you. And there's, there's, there's must be this tension. So you've got lots of nonprofits like Jerome and my school center coming to the city with requests and the city on this side has to be open to them, but can't do everything. So how do you manage that dance with all the requests you're getting uh, from, from nonprofits like ours? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really good question. And I would say for me, it really connects back to, to where I started. So I'm a, I'm a West Philly native. I grew up in Cos Creek. And the funny story is, is that I met Jerome when I was in my first year of be, of learning how to be an environmental professional, um, and and you know never thinking that I would I would be in this place and and had a, had a whole bunch of jobs since then and and kept connected with Jerome all along the way and and I mentioned that story because I do think it's really important to see folks like Jerome who looks like me who's doing good things in my community and understanding what you can do when you have an entrepreneurial attitude and a vision for what you want to achieve. So for me, I take that with me into city government, into some of the bureaucracy that we encounter, which is there, but you have to have a sense of vision and a motivation and, and sort of just um, ingenuity to try to get things done. And so uh, what I would say is, is that for, from how I engage with nonprofits is, is that bring, bring us your best vision, bring us your, your best um, desire for what you want to see, because I assure you that that aligns with where we ultimately want to go as well. It's just a matter of how we ultimately get there. And everybody has their role to play. Everybody has, um, you know, something to contribute to the process and we just have to work together to do it, which is why, you know, I'm very happy to have continued in multiple spaces to, to collaborate with, with Jerome and, and, and have met new colleagues like Radika and, and continue to, to look to them whenever I want to germinate a new project because I, it is really important to have folks working at different spaces to move this issue That's forward. Great. That's great. Um, it's just eight o'clock, everybody. We're going to go for about five more minutes. If you have some last question you want to get into the, any of the panelists, feel free to put it in chat. Um, for Jerome, you're still getting lots of nice congratulations. So are you. Uh, Salim, you're getting congratulations too from Dottie. Um, uh, Sabira, your mom checked in on, on chat, so make sure you see that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're talking a little bit maybe up here, which is, which is great, but I want to bring it down to something really concrete and, uh, and the importance of a tree or trees, because there's an, an extraordinary correlation in Philadelphia between communities that lack tree cover and, and their economic, uh, how well they're performing economically. So um, neighborhoods that are, perform that are underperforming economically tend to have no tree cover. And this has huge impact. It, it, that neighborhood's hotter. The residents likely don't have air conditioning because they, they, they're, they're poorer. So climate change is going to be worse on those, on those neighborhoods. So trees can mitigate that. Trees also, we're talking about asthma rates in the city of Philadelphia, trees take out smog. So planting of street trees 
um, you know, just bearing Overbrook under a canopy of trees would have extraordinary benefits on a whole bunch of things from, you know, from, from your asthma to, to, to climate change. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a concrete example of the kind of things that we can be doing in the city of Philadelphia. And I believe the city has plans for, for reforesting or retreating. Ret so draw my bet you planted a few trees in your time with, at Overbrook. Yeah, well, when we first came out to Lancaster Avenue, there was only one tree between 63rd Street and 59th. And uh, now uh, we have 75 trees, uh, bioretention basins, swells. So we collect a lot of our stormwater on Lancaster Avenue. Uh, we even have uh, bioretention systems that redistribute uh, stormwater uh, to tree trenches. So it's a, it's a lot of a lot of improvements over the years since we've been there. But, he, but here's the big thing, right, that, that I really want to keep emphasizing, is that you, you have, we have to think about it not just from a planning perspective, because we're going to plan and, and, and plan for what needs to be done, but it's, it's a, a whole lot more elegant approach when the citizens themselves see the value of it. And what we're always, the tension that we're always struggling against is our experiential life, versus our aspiration, the things that we desire to do versus what we've experienced. And if we have communities that are under maintenance, other service, historically, right. then people remember that. If they realize that the, 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 the municipal systems and the municipal uh, utilities were not maintained properly in their community, they don't trust it. So a lot of our work is building trust a lot of our work has to be around making sure that people who, through their experience, had a derogatory exposure to this environmental condition, we have to let people know that we hear them and that we're willing to make sure that the, what has happened to them in the past is being respected and it will not happen to them in the future. And then we'll get greater buy-in. We have more trees than we can give away. There are people who have anecdotal issues that they say, you know, I could talk to people all the time. They say, listen, I don't want those trees breaking up the pipes. I don't want them breaking up my, my water pipes, my sewer pipes. And there's a, a big discussion that has to happen around right. what that really represents. Uh, but again, it's about, and I'm going to let Tavis jump on this because I, I know she has a lot of experience. It's a big <laughs> issue around making sure that we take the time to treat that as a legitimate concern. But Tavis, yep. I didn't talk about your- Wait, it's the Tavis, other thing, Tavis, and I know- Tavis, ahead, you, you jump in a second, but for, for the panelists, um, uh, while Tavis is talking, think of some sort of concluding remarks to sort of wrap this all up. So sure. think about what you might add, but Tavis, go for it. No, I, I was just gonna say, uh, you, you know, it's such a great comment that it's really, it's really up to the people, you know, I know from all my study that trees are better, more trees are better, but you, you know, you trees always... increase the property value of the house sure. that's in front of. Sure. Plant a street but... tree, you can sell your house for more. Anyway, go ahead. Sure. But, but, you know, it is when you start to really listen to people and my favorite, this is my favorite story of being a tree tender and, you know, helping neighborhoods get on board with trees. And, and an old lady said to me, I don't want a tree. <laughs> and I, you know, I was like shocked. I was in my twenties. What do you mean you don't want a tree? And she said to me, I mean, like this, I'm not kidding. Trees bring birds. <laughs> and I thought, my God, what's wrong with birds? You know, but I thought, oh my gosh, what's wrong with birds? And, and you know, I thought it was going to be like the, the, the poop on her car. or I didn't know what it was. And, and she said, it's the birds. They live down the street. So, you know, we had to take a walk and go down the street. And this woman, I guess, had been walking to work under an overpass. And when I say there were like 400 pigeons living under there, I mean, you know, maybe there were eight. And she hated it. And that was her, it's just what Jerome said, it was her entire association with trees. It was this stupid overpass and these damn birds. And, and you know, I mean, eventually we, we, we came to an understanding of one another. And, you know, I don't, I don't think she hates birds birds or trees anymore but it was really eye-opening for me because that wasn't my lived experience I'm like oh, oh you don't like the goldfinches you know? 
<laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Taylor, we'll go back to you in a second, but Radhika, do you have any thoughts to help us summarize the evening and the conversation? Oh, I just wanted to thank both Jerome and Sabira because I think you both kind of bring these pillars that Jerome's talking about to life. You're embodying an approach that is thinking about inclusion and respect. And I like how you both bring perspectives and you take on these roles that like you both pointed out have not been traditionally done by people that look like you. So having people like you in the room, having those voices centered, having you take on the leadership. And I think it's really kind of cool to see the bridge here tonight between Sabira and Jerome. Like I think all the work you all are doing is very inspiring. So I just want to thank you. And I think these are very well-deserved awards. Radhika Thomas Jefferson University, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Salim, thoughts from you? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo all that and, and just maybe reiterate Jerome's point. I, I think, you know, when we look at some of these issues, we need to understand how we got here and, and some of the things we face today, like which neighborhoods have trees versus which ones that don't, those were intentional decisions, not just, right. um, you know, the invisible hand causing things to happen. And so we need to make sure that when we're thinking about m where we go moving forward, that the perspective of those who traditionally been left out of these processes are informing where, where we're going. And, and we do need a bigger, a more intersectional approach than traditionally what we've historically have used in environmental movement. And I'm confident from what we've seen tonight that we're on a good, a good track. Great, thank you. Salim Chapman from the Office of Sustainability, our Chief Resilience Officer. Thank you, Salim. Davis, back to you, wrap up thought. <laughs> I, I am so honored to be here tonight. I'm so happy to see my friend Jerome be honored and see Sabira honored. Um, over the years, uh, Jerome and I, you know, started as a, cl a client uh, relationship and uh, moved to a colleague relationship and have, I think, a, a friendship with a lot of conversations. And I've been very honored with working with Jerome and everyone at Overbrook for allowing me into the conversations and, and being able to, uh, to talk about uh, what we love, what we hate, what works, what doesn't work, when we're right, when we're wrong. And, and Sabira, I have um, uh, seen you through the eyes of my son, who has been active in the climate movement and, and just, you know, really um, inspired by your words. So it's, it's just, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. That's Tavis Stockwell of Viridian Design Studio. Her work is stunningly gorgeous. So check it out on her website. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Tavis. Jerome, you get the last word. Well, I am just, again, grateful and, and thankful for this uh, recognition tonight. And um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see all the wonderful faces, many of our friends and colleagues who, who took the time to, to chime in tonight. And um, I, I wanna thank uh, Radhika and Salim and, and Tavis for their participation and Sabira uh, for her award. Uh, she's very inspiring. And uh, again, makes me think of my son who's graduating from high school. And, and so uh, it's, it's always wonderful to, to get these moments of inspiration. And uh, again, thank the, the Meg's family. I, I see Benny has a, a, someone joining in with him. And uh, we wanna thank you for, uh, again, keeping this legacy alive and, and making this award available. But my, my parting comment is that um, again, this is a human-centric approach that we embrace at the Overbrook Center. We put people first. And um, there's a video that we had our, our young people put together over the summer, and it was about environmental justice. And one of the taglines at the end of the video, it talked about freedom is mine. And we were looking at the whole concept that environmental justice wasn't enough the idea that we had to get beyond environmental injustices in order to claim justice. We wanted to go further and claim freedom. And as part of your human freedom, environmental freedoms belong as a, as a subset of that. So freedom is mine, I'm claiming it, and we're gonna do everything that we can to preserve that freedom and to convert, preserve the environments around us. So thank you so much for your time and for your recognition, we appreciate it. Thank you, Jerome. The 15th annual Henry Meigs Awardee, and this is coming to you really soon, Jerome. So thank you so much. 
Congratulations to you. Thank you, Sabira. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you to our board. Thank you to Aaliyah for your help. Thank you to Amanda, our Zoom co-pilot. Uh, and thank you to the Megs family for keeping the Megs legacy alive. So thank you, yes. everybody. See you real soon. Take care. Come, Come for on. a walk at this Google Center. Come for a walk. Very good.